Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode here at Catholic Table Talk Podcast. This is the podcast where everything Catholic is on the table. Um, you have you see a couple of faces um, with me today. Um, another great show in stock today for you. Um, before we get to that, though, we'll make some history today. But before we get to that, thank you again for liking, subscribing, and commenting and sharing the show with your friends and family, and spreading Catholic Table Talk nationwide. Um, if you are new to the show, please like, comment, subscribe, and all that great stuff, and so you never miss a show. Um, also, if you have a show topic, a speaker request, or if you like to order merch or donate towards the show, please email us at our trusty email, catholictt at gmail.com. Again, catholictt at gmail.com. The official email of Catholic Table Talk. And if you'd like to sponsor the show, email us. Um, today's sponsor is Dr. Katrina Ning. Um, she is a Catholic physician, author, speaker, and nonprofit founder. Um, learn more about how she can help you, your family, and your community by visiting her website, mdkatrina.com. Again, mdkatrina.com. Um, thank you for thank you to Katrina for sponsoring today's show. All right, so I said um, we're kind of making a little bit of history here today. Um, never have had this yet on the show. I always um, was thinking about this, and uh, one of the guests actually recommended it. Um, so today we're going to do it a little bit different. I'm going to hand the uh, keys off to um, my two guests here. Um, you may recognize one from episode 48, uh, Father Aaron Kuhn. He was talking about how to love gay people back in Lee, um, back in episode 38. So um, welcome back, Father Aaron. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very nice to be with you, Billy, and I appreciate it. And you, Troy, as well. And then, yeah, Troy Bonk, um, is, uh, he, he asked, he has some questions about the Catholic faith today. So uh, Troy, thank you for coming on the show. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So, like I said, Troy, um, this is totally on you. Um, I want to get have all your questions get answered um, by Father. So, go ahead and start us off. Okay. Um, so the the sheet that uh, I think that you have there, um, the first question is, if God said His Word was all we need, why would we seek religious traditions which end up according to Jesus in Mark uh, 7, 13, make the word of God of none effect. And there are scripture references above there of Matthew 4, 4 and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Yeah. And are you okay if I just sort of read that out loud for those that might be watching? And Oh, sure. Absolutely. Next of that. Yep. So, um, uh, it, so you gave a part of the question here, you added uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Uh, and then from 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And then uh, also add to that from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the church does not derive her certainty, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sent sentiments of devotion and reverence. And then Canon uh, 750 out of the Code of Canon Law backs that up and, and takes it a step further. All that is contained in the written word of God or in tradition, that is in the one deposit of faith, must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. So taking those all together, and then your question here is, if God said his word is all that we need, why would we seek religious traditions which end up, according to Jesus, um, making the word of God of none effect? of no use. So somehow, if I'm getting it correct, and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm getting that right, Troy, that yes. by having tradition next to uh, or seemingly replacing scripture, that they are in a, um, 
the one seems to contradict the other, and therefore it would make the word of God of none effect, in which, of course, then um, would uh, seem to make what we do to just be silly added on traditions, added on things that we're, as Catholics, that we're believing in that aren't really necessary for our salvation, like the scriptures would say that are necessary for salvation. Is that right? Some, somewhat right, as I say that? Um, I, you know, and I honestly, I, I wouldn't call what you do silly. I mean, I, I think that's, no, a, no, 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 no. And, and, and I wouldn't, I would not take that stance at all. I mean, I, I think you, there's a, in a lot of ways, the Catholic church holds scripture in high value mm -hmm. as I also do. And, and so that's really important here. And, and so really it is just the, the, anytime when I see tradition being either equal to or elevated above scripture, it is where I, I I struggle with. So if you could give some clarity to that. Sure, you bet. So I think it was a really good choice that you made there, uh, pulling from Mark chapter 7. So let me just read some of it, because I think it helps for anybody in the audience here, why Jesus would say, making the word of God of none effect because of these extra traditions. So Jesus is there, and then the Pharisees and scribes who had come from Jerusalem are gathered around him. They observe that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. Um, for the, the Pharisees, in fact, all Jews do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplaces, they do not eat without purifying themselves and all these other traditions. I'm skim, skimming through here. So the Pharisees and scribes question Jesus, why do your disciples not follow the traditions of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? And then Jesus responds, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, uh, as it is written in Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. And then Jesus follows this up, you disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. Um, he went on to say, how well you have set aside the commandments of God in order to uphold your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, whoever curses father and mother shall die. Yet you say, if a person says to father and mother, any support you might have for me is korban, meaning dedicated to God, you allow him to do nothing more than for his father and mother. You nullify the word of God in favor of tradition that you have handed on, and you do many such things. I'm using a tradition from the, or I would call it a translation from the New American Bible. Um and that, um, so that might be, did I finish that out there? Let me look here. Did I hit that quote 713? I did. Okay. So part of it is, um, I think it just the context of the, where this is at, we're dealing with, um, what do I want to say here? The the Pharisees. Do you, have you heard where the Pharisees came from? Do you know Do you know um, Troy where they their background is and what the where they're from? Why they suddenly show up in the Gospels and they're not named in the Scriptures before that? I am not familiar with all their background, though. So and and you know I didn't until about a year ago. I did the Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmitz, and I thought that was really insightful. So about 150 years before Jesus, you have the Maccabean revolt. So um, let's back up in history a little bit. Um, from the time of Moses, when they first get up to the promised land and they enter in the promised land, that from that moment all the way until about 50 years before Christ, the people of Israel have been living in the promised land. It's been their own territory and it's around that year 750, right around that time, It's that's a loose date, um, that you have the movement in of the first of five kingdoms that come in and take over the promised land. And that's what we would call the Babylonian exile. It's in the second of the, the company or the nations that are finally allowed to come in. And Isaiah preaches both before the arrival of the Babylonians and after the Babylonians, depending on which half of Isaiah that you read. Now, um, so Isaiah is warning everyone, look, you, you've been allowing idolatry and these other religious practices from the outside to be creeping in and taking over your religious faith as people of Israel. 
uh, and as as uh, people of the tribe of Judah. And the Lord is warning you that he's going to allow these other countries to come in and take you over because you're not being faithful. And so through multiple different prophets in the prophetic period, the Lord is warning them, warning them, warning them, and particularly under Jeremiah, uh, that the city itself is going to be destroyed in Jerusalem. First, the Assyrians come in, and then followed by the Babylonians, later the Persians, then the Greeks or the Hellenists, and then finally the Romans at the time of Jesus. Uh, it's during the Babylonian time period, when they come in, they come all the way up to the city of Jerusalem and they sack the city, they destroy the city, and there's nothing left. They take they wipe out the in temple entirely. And then under the next group of, and so that's the, where the exile occurs then at that point is the people that are living in the city of Jerusalem, the Jews that are holding on to things, they are dispersed all throughout Babylon, which would be kind of north of Galilee, that uh, what we would call modern day uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran and those those territories. And the Jewish people are dispersed in all those different directions. And the kingly line of David is cut off the the. Um, the, the king is, is uh, as all of his sons are killed in front of him, and then his eyes are poked out. <laughs> Not that that was, that's all a great detail, but nonetheless, so all of this is happening, right? And then uh, while living in exile, one of the lead people helping the king of Persia who comes in, um, he begs the king of Persia, and the king allows him to go back and restore the, the, the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so they go back in and they do that, but all of the gold is gone, all the silver is gone, all the bronze is gone. And he, yes, he was given something of a blank check uh, to go in and rebuild all these things. But this is uh, a time period where basically the people have been living in Babylon for so long, a vast majority of people do not want to return back to the homeland city. They've, they've become accustomed to being in Babylon for 70 years, Babylonian exile. So the Jewish people just only like a small group return, a remnant into the city area. Then when the Greeks move in, um, this is where you would uh, have what was called the Maccabean Revolt. The, if you ever get a chance to read the book of Maccabees, when the, when the Greeks move in, they do a lot of the similar things that the Assyrians and the Babylonians did. When, when they moved into the territory, you're not allowed to practice your religion. You're not allowed to practice your language. You're not allowed to practice... Um, your cultural background. So it's a little bit like the Nazis and the Russians moving into, into Poland and the Polish people just sort of during World War II not being allowed to practice any of those things. So they had to do it underground. And a lot of the, the during that the Assyrian and Babylonian exile, only a handful of people are keeping the faith while they're living in exile. They finally come back and rebuild the temple but then the Greeks come in and start doing the same things that try to wipe out and, and force everybody to worship the Greek gods and live the Greek way of life and practice the Greek language and drop all of your culture, drop all of that stuff. So that's about 150, 150 years before the time of the arrival of Jesus. And it's from the group that survives under Judas Maccabeus and Mattathias, when they go around from city to city throughout the Holy Land and breaking down the temples and um, restoring worship, and they bring they come all the way back to Jerusalem and they kind of take over Jerusalem. And the the it's about fifty years or so before Christ that the Romans move in, right, and they start taking over in the Jerusalem territories. So it. The second temple that was being built is one that Herod then under the Roman Empire fully expands and starts to rebuild and adding on new wings and all of that. But that secondary temple, there's a group of people during that Roman time period who consider themselves separatists. Um, that's literally the name of Pharisees. These separatists, these ones who feel like they've got it all right they started creating all these extra rules and applications and things that were above and beyond the law of the Torah, the law of Moses, but they kept attributing it to the elders, our elders who lived during the Babylonian, or the, during the, the Greek um, persecution time period as they 
has we were fighting back against them our ancestors they feel like they have all this extra special knowledge they feel like they have all these extra special rules and the only way to really prove that you're faithful under the roman time period is to live like us the separatists the pharisees the scribes okay all of that is the context to be able to hear in these things this is where the extra hand washings come from this is where the these notions of of uh, purification and trying to be ready for the arrival of the Messiah, it's a it's a watered down form of Judaism. I have to be careful as I say that. Um, but it's a when Jesus encounters it, they've got all these extra rules, and they don't they don't have an actual respect for the real relationship with God. And that I feel like when I'm in when I encounter people who look at Catholicism as being an organization that has all these extra rules and works and all of that, that is the comparison that we're that is drawn up. And I think probably rightfully so as a, from an outside view of being able to go, why do you have all these extra rules as Catholics? You don't eat meat on Friday and you don't do this and you don't you have all these extra holy days and you got all the saints and statues and you know, like I have behind me on the wall over here and like you have all these extra things what about the relationship with the lord god what about the relationship with, with our, our lord and god and that's at the heart of, of your question why would we seek all of these extra traditions and things and make the word of god of none effect well, well um the answer to that is that the traditions that that i see that we have within catholicism um are a complement and an extension of that relationship. Now, one of the things that we I know we'll need to talk about here, and I'm not sure if it's in with the, the next question or the, the third third question that you've got in here, um, but I think it's relevant to hear is may, maybe you were taught something that I don't actually know. So I'd like to ask you on this, Troy, if you if you know. When St. Paul refers to the, the scriptures, um, all, like in Second Timothy, when he's writing that uh, his letter to a friend Timothy, he says, all scripture is given inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect through, uh, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So it's all, all scripture is given inspiration by God. To which scriptures is Paul referring? I would take it as all scripture. I mean, I, I understand like certain things you, you, you get into um, different stories of the Bible. They're relating to history. So obviously we would avoid Baal worship and mm -hmm. things like that. But I mean, they're talking about historical things. So, but when it comes to worshiping and honoring God, following after him wholeheartedly, and that's what I see as scripture. So I would take it as the Bible and be so blunt as saying the non-Catholic Bible. And I mean sure. that with all due respect to you. No, I understand. But, um, yeah. That would be my stance. So, so that's what I see as all scripture. Yep, and I'm 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 not meaning any trickery by this question at all because I agree with you that I agree with the statement that he has on all scriptures given inspiration of God. I think it's worth the reflection of he was very likely not referring to himself. Like the letters that Paul writes, I'm trying to remember when he writes 2 Timothy. I doubt that Paul himself thought he was authoring scripture as he's writing. You know, that'd be very arrogant. It'd be like me writing with my bulletin articles that I do in our bulletin every week and going, oh yeah, add this into the script, into the scriptures, because I know it belongs to God if I as I'm writing my own stuff. What we do is we look back at, in later in time, we look back and go, you know what? Paul's stuff is so good and there are no errors in it. When you read Paul, it's an extension of what we've always believed. Um, as Christians. And so we're willing to make a declaration that even Paul, even though he didn't, he was referring to Old Testament. When he, when he was considering scripture, he's thinking the five books of the Torah, the wisdom literature, 
uh, in the historical books, the uh, Chronicles and um, First and Second Kings and the uh, the Psalm literature, the wisdom literature, all of that stuff is for him, that's the scriptures he's referring to when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine. I, I, it seems to me that that's the way to read that statement, right? Now, we're able to also extend that to include the four gospels. Um, and we're able to extend that to the letters written not only by Paul, his seven letters, but also the letters written by the apostles and the book of Revelation. Um, and because it's born out of the tradition. So that first hundred years from 33 AD up until uh, the end of the, uh, right, entering into the, the um, is it the 100s of the second century? So the, the whole first century is the apostles and the disciples of the Lord God going around and quoting Old Testament while giving their New Testament about how Jesus is the new Moses. He's the new Elijah. He's the new David. He's the new, he fulfills all of the Old Testament scriptures. And so that time period when the New Testament scriptures haven't really been written, because I don't know if any of them were written before 20 to 30 years after Christ died. So that that first 20 years as they're going out, the only scriptures they're going to be referring to as being inspired are going to be backwards in time. So you only have tradition at that point that's being expressed from the verbal communication from one person to the next, to the next, to the next about who God is and who Jesus Christ is and what he's about and the stories about who Jesus is. And um, that takes us because Christianity is spreading so rapidly and so quickly throughout the empire during that first 200 years, um, all the way up really into the mid 300s, uh, it's kind of chaotic, you know, that you have individual Christian communities who all have portions of stuff written down by one of the gospel writers and a portion of one of the letters that Paul would have given. And, oh, you have a letter over in Corinth? Hey, can we get a copy of that and bring it over to our location? Because we've got a letter here in Rome that Paul wrote to us, to the Romans. And can we get a, you know, can we share copies? And um, there are multiple different copies floating around. And this is where you, you, uh, um, it, it, because of the chaos of all of that that's happening as the tradition is sort of unfolding, you get to the, 300s and the emperor constantine his mother is a christian now and as he comes into power even though he himself was not yet christian he allowed christianity to become a legal legalized religion amongst the other ones and so the persecutions would die down and then at that point and as it happens then he's the as the persecutions die out now these christian communities are starting to flourish and this is the time where they start going, can I get a copy? 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 And at some point, um, the amount of chaos between Christian communities is such that the emperor says, look, let's just get all of the heads of the different Christian communities together, the episcopoi, the overseers, the bishops, and let's get them to come to a consensus on what belongs to this New Testament. And... Um, that's where you get the, in 325, the calling of the Council uh, of Nicaea. So that's in modern day Turkey, if I remember correctly. I was, um, and that's where the, the, the Episcopoi, the bishops, the, the overseers at the time period of different, different commu Christian communities, that's when they create the canon. And they come up with and go, yes, this document over here written by this Christian community, it has a whole bunch of good things about Jesus or a whole good things about Christianity, but we're not going to include it in the canon. And this one is written uh, by so-and-so, but they're not an apostle, so we're not going to include that. And they get down to the brass tacks and go, if it's not written by an apostle or by Paul, we're not including it. And so they they make that kind of clarity there. So that is a moment of tradition 
that gives us the script the the scriptures and then then that just continues to unfold throughout the 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 future then as when situations come up where not only are they looking for clarity about what did Jesus say or what did St. Paul say, they now now they would all have, um, hopefully within the next few hundred years, copies of, of all of the different letters and the, the Gospels being brought together. Um, but now when new questions are coming up about how to deal with moral questions, they, they go to the leaders of the communities to ask them to commiserate together and then you'd have another council and another council and another council and another council always with the intention of making sure that faith is being preserved and that it's being clearly taught because you have the arrival of christian leaders like arius and nestorius and marcion um, who are either bishops or they are preachers who are going around and they're actually saying heretical things and using the scriptures as their means to say those heresies. And so Arianism, Nestorianism, Marcionism, there's just a laundry list of all kinds of, of uh, from the second and third and fourth and fifth centuries, these varying uh, heresies that are, are spreading all around. Sorry, can I just clarify one thing here? Sure, yeah. Are, are you um, implying that the canon is still open or do you feel that the canon is closed? closed <clears throat> okay yep so it there is decided. no more new revelations well so the way that it is understood is um there is no new public revelation so they make a distinction between private and public um there's no new public revelation about who jesus is and what he's about um beyond what the apostles told us that is necessary for our salvation so that, that all of those are nuanced little elements. And I'm, I'm, I want to be careful that maybe even I didn't uh, nuance my words enough. But the, no, the notion here is that what we need for our salvation stops with the, the, the scriptures and the Bible. And that is a Catholic belief. Now, clarifications and development of doctrine that needs to happen over time based off of things like, uh development of certain sciences like they never had to face cloning <laughs> back in that time period this is the first generation where cloning is an actual situation that we might have to deal with as christians and say whether it belongs to jesus or it doesn't in the use of science in that particular way I, I'll just talk, chime in, Father. Um, first sure. of all, wait at so um, I mean, I just love um listening to the way you talk and I think I find myself just listening, not jotting down notes. Um, but uh, um, according to Catholic.com, um, you mentioned um when was Second Timothy wrote um Catholic.com, um, it was approximately they say in the year. 67. I don't know if that sounds right or not. But the um, Roman the Romans moving in. Um second Timothy was when. Oh, second Timothy written there. Yeah. yeah. In AD. Yep. 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 Gotcha. Yep. Okay. All right. We probably need to move on to one of the other questions. We'll we'll end up rolling back and forth, I would guess, a little bit here. Um she sorry, I don't mean to take over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um so the next question is going to be about deeds and um, good deeds, good works in order to get to heaven. Why can't we just trust in God's word? So you started out with um, a quote from Ephesians, for by grace we are saved through, you are saved through faith, and that none of yourselves, that is the gift of God, um, not of works, lest any man should boast. So by, by uh, not of works saved, but by through faith. Yep. Therefore, being justified by faith, this is Romans, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by being justified by faith. Hebrews 10, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And uh, then the Catechism, Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, number 1821, 1821, 
In every circumstance, each one of us should hope with the grace of God to persevere to the end and to obtain the joy of heaven as God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished with the grace of Christ. Then in Canon 849, uh, baptism, the gate to the sacraments necessary for salvation, in fact, or at least in intention, um, by which men and women are freed from their sins, are reborn as children of God. Okay, so why do we need to work or do good works to get to heaven? Why can't we just trust God in his word? Um, so this is a common misunderstanding about how grace and justification and righteousness and uh, works as far as like, what do Catholics actually believe and how do we interpret these things? So although I, I can understand looking from the outside and saying, it looks to me like Catholics are saying you need to, that you get rewarded for your good works and that baptism is one of these acts, these works that you do. Um, if those are human actions and not God's actions happening for us, then I would agree with it. However, what we're saying is, God is the one doing all of the work. It's his work. So what we're doing is we're receiving his gift. And my response in the reception thereof, it's his free, his free gift to us that he gives of grace and of salvation. My reception of it is to say, I trust you as Lord of my life, as a savior from death for me. And now everything that I do of good uh, that, that which I do unto the least of these, uh, I'm doing unto you. So there's nothing that I do with my life of good on my own that I'm earning of anything of heaven. But what I am doing is completing the work of Christ and his desire to help save the world. So every action that I do of goodness is an extension of Christ himself. He's the one doing the work. He's the one saving the soul of the person in front of me. When we do baptism, uh, although I, as the minister, say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, um, it's because in that moment, Christ is the actor. So the speaking in the first person is the, the Christ speaking in the first person. When the priest is at the altar offering the words of institution over the bread and the wine um, so that it transforms into his body and blood and the salvific act of Jesus Christ of his his life, his death on the cross, the crucifixion and the, the resurrection and the communion of heaven and the kind of the fulfillment of that from the book of Hebrews and the, the, um, the book of Revelation. All of that is Christ acting, Christ acting in the person of the priest, Christ acting in the people who are in worship and prayer, Christ acting through the sacraments. They're his actions. I participate in it. Now, um, a helpful way to look at this is uh, it's really only if I become an obstruction to Jesus, you know, that I would not be able to receive his gift and be able to, to enter into the divine life with him in salvation. Um, he, he desires our salvation, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want man to perish uh, rather that he wants us uh, to be saved. So um if I want to put a block up and say, no, I'm not interested in heaven, he will respect my freedom and then I just won't go and I'll go to hell. And that's that. Um, but if I beg his mercy, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, he wants to give the gift. And if he, the promise through him is that we will receive it. So the salvation is his gift and we participate in it. So it's really kind of, it's a combination, all of the above, rather than a, a contradiction thereof. The reward for good works is really, it's, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I, I still, it seems, still seems like a contradiction because you, you use the words, Jesus wants to give us the gift of salvation. And I agree with that a hundred percent. Yep. But in the... Uh, what you were reading earlier on on the paper here, it says that there is rewards for your good deeds, and accomplished in, in, with in, the grace of Christ, right? That that's the, well, that's some afraid. of the yep. some of the stances on the on the Catholic Church is you have to do these things in order to earn your salvation. You have to be baptized. You have to do the sacraments. You have to do these things 
to earn it, then it, those things turn into good deeds and it's no longer by faith, it's by your works. Yes, now you may include Christ, but that's not Christ exclusively. It's Jesus with the good works. That is the, the stance that I'm hearing from the from the Catholic faith. Yeah, I think that's because it's it's lacking. Um, perhaps the way that you're hearing it is through the lens of that uh, um, the notion that somehow um, works and not faith, right? I mean, I think the nuance there is that you're not going to do any good works apart from faith. That that's just like you're not going to. Um, and any so any good works are accomplished through us by Christ as a result of the fact that faith preceded. And so by faith you are saved. I mean, that's that's the reality. The the works are the extension of the faith and are included with the faith. They're not separate from the faith. You can't you you can't be entering into heaven by the works alone. That that is a very clear Catholic notion. Well, then I think that's a clear biblical notion, right? Yep. And but according, I'm just looking at the the, the statements here, and that doesn't seem to be well, how it's worded. I mean, it well, says that it, that they're necessary, that baptism and the sacraments are necessary for salvation. Yep, that's what it says. And so, understanding that um, it's the ordinary, so a, a lot of what happens with canon law, canon law is trying to put the theology into practice, and so they're using presumed language, right? Like the the law itself um, of the church presumes the theology has already worked out before that. So certain things like um, Christ is the one that's acting through the sacrament of baptism. That's just a presumption that the law carries with it. So if we reinsert this and say, Jesus is bap baptizing of us is necessary for salvation. That's because we understand that that is the ordinary action that Christ acts, asks us to do. Now, if, if um, there are circumstances outside of our control... So this is also within the theology of, of the, what we believe, that if there are circumstances outside of our control that do not allow us to do the ordinary actions that Jesus asked us to do, he can always work extraordinarily. That's his prerogative. If he wants to save somebody without baptism, he can do that because it's his grace. He's the one that's giving it. But as far as like, what are we supposed to do to know that we did what he asked us to do? He said, go forth and baptize all nations. He said to do that, so we do that. Like that's to not baptize would be to go against his command to do that. Right, and and, and I'm not even disagreeing with baptism mm -hmm. or the need for it. Yep. I, my question is needing it in the sense of without it, you're you cannot have salvation. That's where the intention part comes, at least in intention. So one of the things that we've new, nuanced in how we kind of this is where you get into developments of doctrine, right? So um, doctrines are we human language. We're always trying to articulate things with the use of the language that's in front of us. So I don't speak Latin. I can read some Latin, but definitely the Christian church for from basically the 300s until <laughs> uh, the last 200 years, uh, Latin was a dominant language that was being used, maybe not spoken everywhere, but certainly during the Roman Empire. Greek before that, as a result of that, the Greek push of those five um, time periods when Alexander the Great comes through. I think that's him. And then... Um, anyway, so we're always trying to use language, right? And language is always evolving, um, and so we're trying to find ways to, to nuance how we talk about things. That's why there's constantly new translations coming out of the scriptures in order to, um, for how we speak about it, to speak to the language of the current generation. All of that to say, um, where was I going with this? One of the things that w was seemed to uh, be a teaching that was, um, it was a theological idea 
that we've never considered uh, an absolute towards salvation, but it came about from Augustine way back in the 300s into the 400s. He was trying to figure out, well, what happens to babies that die before they're born? How does Christ save them if they have not had a chance to yet ask God for grace, whether through the sacrament or otherwise? Um, and so the notion was, well, the best I can come up with as a theologian at my time period is we'll just kind of say that they're in a limbo state. So that's where limbo came from. It was a theological notion of let's just see if that kind of covers these thoughts for an idea of what, what happens with babies. And maybe they're just at the highest level of hell, or maybe they're just inside of purgatory, or they're into heaven, or like where, where do they sit at, or just outside the gates of heaven. All of those, that's theologians sitting there and trying to go, gosh, how do we describe this for people? Um the development of the doctrine has been as such all the way to the present now that we just kind of go limbo it was a nice idea for a while, but we just simply don't need it as a tool anymore. So it's been dropped in the last 20, 30 years. Instead, the way that we talk about it is um, God is the one who knows our circumstances and we know that if given the opportunity, the ordinary means that he wants to use is through the sacrament of baptism. He is the one who is the giver of the grace. He can give that same grace he would give through baptism to someone outside of the sacrament. Um, and in part, it's because the intention of that person was to be baptized at some point. And so why would he deny that person who wanted to be baptized, who wanted to enter into that life of grace? Why would he deny them that? seems very unfair that God would be that way. So we we leave it to his mercy and to his um, his sorting it out as judge. What we know is for, that the ordinary means is baptism. So then we talk about baptism of desire and then also baptism of blood. So those are three that if you look through the catechism, of the Catholic Church on baptism, you'll see those words articulated in there. And that's because, again, the, 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 the person who was on their way to the church to get baptized and got in a car accident, is God going to reject them? It just seems ridiculous. So the baptism of desire is there. We leave it to the Lord's justice, his mercy, to figure out where the person is at. Um, likewise, the same with um, someone who dies as a martyr before being baptized. Right, and and I I can go along with with some, with some of that in in the sense of uh, I think you're agreeing then baptism isn't necessary then for salvation. Well, it is and it isn't right. So it says there that this is the you can't just disregard it. Right, I, I, and I'm not I'm not trying to disregard it. No, no, I no, think right. I think God Jesus is calling us to be baptized as a I would see it as a symbol of a new life in Christ that I have make a willful choice, choose Christ to live a different way, to live for him and not for mm -hmm. myself. Right. So I would take it as being more symbolic and your, your stance and, and according to the Catholic faith, it would be to some degree a necessity for salvation. Well, because that's the, that's the activity by which the grace is imparted. Well, scripturally, according to what we were reading earlier, according to like the Ephesians 2, um, Romans 5, the Hebrews 10, it doesn't look that way to me. Well, scriptures that we read, it says um, not by works in Ephesians, mm -hmm. and it says by faith in Romans, and yep. no more sacrifices in Hebrews. Okay, when the, no more sacrifices is uh, um, relative to the uh, the sacrifice on the cross, right? No other sacrifice is necessary for salvation outside of the sacrifice on the cross. And what I would concur with that. That's the church's teaching as well. The justification by faith, um, it's good to remember that Paul, that's a that's a, lim a singular phrase of Paul that also needs to be matched up with all of his other phrases on faith. So not just singularly that one itself by itself. And then again, the presumption here is Faith in this case is uh, not just simply a mental assent, just an idea, 
No, I agree. Right. Our, our, a genuine faith is mm -hmm. not just head knowledge. It's a internal devotion with our heart being dedicated right. our own life to Christ. Yep. That, that is a genuine biblical faith. Yep. So, and so yeah, just a mental state, I agree, is not faith at all. Right. And so I think if we um, extend the, the theology stuff, and I'm not super articulate about everything that I just said, right? Uh, also, because uh, like I mentioned earlier, I can feel the fever in my body from this illness that I'm dealing with. <laughs> But if, okay, so if that's the moment where faith uh, begins to be interiorized, right? So the claiming is Christ as Lord and Savior, the public action then that I devote myself toward, the ordinary action of the grace where the grace is, is uh, sealed, the Holy Spirit is sealed within us, um, within the action of baptism then, and if I die without it, can he still extend his grace to us without baptism? Yes, that's where you get to the intention part. Uh, but the ordinary action of the experience of that grace is going to be in the sacrament itself. So all of those little nuances together don't contradict what Paul says of being justified by faith. Okay. And, and, and I'm not too concerned about Paul's teaching. It was more of the, the, the doctrine of the, of the Catholic church is what they're yep. written down here, which again, I, I know you don't quite see it that way, but that's just what I read. It's, it looks like the contradiction to me. I can see how you could read it that way. When I read it, I don't read it that way. I don't read the contradiction part. And that's partly, right. I, think, I think just over time, um, when I was going through seminary, I was going in to all of the classes and everything with the same kind of mindset of yourself, trying to make sure that I really figured all of this out. And it was over time, I think just a uh, uh, when you start adding all the different parts of the different teachings of Paul together, it creates a, a much larger picture than just simply the um, one that would interpret the catechism's explanation there. As, um, I don't know. I, I, I think the it's a broader so, so, interpretation. So, so you, are, you, are you saying that Paul somehow would contradict himself in scripture that he's saying you don't need to have other it's not by works and then later on he says it is by works somewhere um, is that what you're saying well part of it I think we're going to get into that whole canon part right because you do get to uh, um, we accept canonically James the letter the is it letter James? Yeah. The letter yeah, the book of James. James, yeah. yeah. Um, and where, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. So that's a to me, you 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 complement St. Paul. You don't contradict St. Paul. You you complement what he's got there by I agree. That extension. Yeah. I agree. And I wouldn't see the book of James as contradictory to Paul. And mm -hmm. it is a compliment, but it's it's still those works that we do in according to James we do as a reflection of our faith, not a way of salvation. Right. Um, with the little nuance I would add from the Catholic perspective that it's Christ working through me. So it it's not faith and works don't separate out like they're agreed. They're just so united that you can look at the works and go, that's faith. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, that's the, um, so I mean, the church has been very careful not to, in her teaching, say that works is what saves you, not faith. Because we always presume that the works has faith already as a presumption to it. So if you're going to say that works are part of that salvific process, it's because there's a presumption that faith precedes it and is part of it and thoroughly in it. And it's it's why we don't go to the extent of saying works and not faith. Mm -hmm. and, and in my experience, I mean, I've, and I hate to admit this, but there's been times when an unbeliever has acted better than I have as a believer. Sure, and it yeah. shames me a little bit. It's like, oh, I really messed that up. But the point is, an unbeliever can act in a really good way and still not go to heaven because they are unrepentant and not trusting in Christ. So point is good works alone does not automatically mean that there's a faith, a part of it. 
it can be exclusive, good works can be exclusive and, and that person can still end up in hell. Yeah, and I would say that we're fighting as Catholics, or I, I find that I'm fighting as a, a minister to help convince Catholics of the same social cultural thing that we're living in right now in modern era, uh, where it doesn't matter what Christian denomination you're talking to, there's, there's a whole ton of Christians who believe that I'm a good person and therefore I'm going to go to heaven. That's like, that's a heresy. <laughs> I agree. And it's not a Catholic heresy, right? It's a, it's a, just a misunderstanding of who Jesus is and what he's about. Um, yep. I so, agree. Yep. Um, hey. I know we're running uh, tight on time. I, I yeah, was going to say, um, can you, do you have to leave Troy? Um, you want to come back um, and make I, this a two part uh, series or, you know, I, I think I do need to get going here, but I would really sure. love to uh, continue this another time. That would be really great. Sure. Sure. All right. Um, we'll let you go, Troy. And uh, thank you for coming on, Troy, again. Um, uh, we'll get a two part. We'll figure something out. We'll get back together and resume this. Um, really had a great time. So thank you, Father Aaron, um, for coming in. Well, for talking with your fever. Um, really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, Troy, for coming on as well. Yes. I need more cowbell. Thank you, Billy. That's, thank thank you, Gordon. Gordon. Yeah, you bet. It's good talking thank with you. I uh, really appreciate it. It might be good to hear your story a little bit more, too, uh, next time we get on and just kind of uh, hear some of your background and where your faith comes from. I, I'd like to hear some of that. So, Okay, sure can. Yeah. Great. All right, All thanks. Right. We'll see you All next right, time, everyone, on Catholic Table right. Talk Podcast.